Good evening, everybody. I hope you're doing well and uh, blessed and highly favored of the Lord tonight. Thank you for joining us for our midweek Bible study. Looking forward to digging into the Word of the Lord tonight with you. Uh, I know you're gathered at home, maybe on your cell phone or on your laptop, watching right now. And I hope and pray that you are highly blessed tonight. Uh, beginning tonight, we are going to do a series on the book of Romans. And I'm really excited about sharing this with you. Uh, we're going to have a great time as we study one of the most powerful books in the New Testament. This is Paul's letter to the church in Rome, and uh, we're going to have a great time as we study the theologically rich material that Paul would write. Uh, I will tell you right now that uh, I am actually using a written resource by a former Bible college professor of mine, Brother Ron Wolford, pastors now in Tennessee, and uh, he has written a study called Romans, the Gospel of God. And so that's what we're going to be studying, his resources. Uh, he does have this resource for sale. If you would like to use it for your local church, uh, you can go to his website, kairosministries.com, and you can purchase that along with additional resources. And I do want to say thank you to Brother Wolford for allowing us to use this. Uh, for those of you that are following along tonight, you can go to our website, calvarytab.life, and you can download the student manual, the student handbook, uh, and follow along with us as we go through this series. It'll be an incredible resource for you uh, as we just dig through some of Paul's writings. And uh, again, you can go to calvarytab.life, click on the resource tab there at the very top of the page, and you can scroll down and, and check that out, download that. Print it out, fill it out, and use it for your own personal reference guide in the book of Romans. Again, thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us. Before we get into the word of the Lord, I want to do something very important. You can never, ever, ever pray enough. So we want to go to the Lord in prayer, ask God for his will and his protection, but also that he would open our understanding tonight as we dig through his word. Would you pray with me? Lord, we love you. God, we're so thankful to be here today, so thankful to be gathered. Thank you for everybody that's listening right now online. I'm asking, Lord, that your hand would keep us and protect us during this time. I pray, Lord, for blessing and favor upon every individual that's under the sound of my voice. I'm asking, God, that your hand would lead us and guide us tonight as we study your word. Don't let this just be something that we do to fill time, but let this get a hold of us. Let this word challenge and change us. Help us to be what you've called us to be and to help us grow and be with, uh, and to learn more of who you are. We love you. We praise you. We thank you in advance for your goodness and mercy. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Again, thank you for joining with me, with, with me today. We're going to get into the word of the Lord and uh, looking forward that each of you are here. Excuse me, my notes are messing up, but I'm glad you are here. First of all, let's begin. If you've got your Bibles with me, with you, open them up to the book of Romans, chapter number 1. We're going to get started here immediately, and I promise to be mindful of the time. First of all, Romans is a very, very interesting book, and it was written uh, by the Apostle Paul. How do we know? Because it says it from the very first verse. Paul lets it very, makes it very clear that he is writing to the church in Rome. Now, couple of things we need to know about Paul. First of all, he is Jewish by birth. Yes, he is Jewish by birth. Uh, he is very fluent in the Hebrew language. He knows the Hebrew language. Uh, but he's also very unique because not only is he a Jew, not only is he very fluent in the Hebrew language, but he is a Roman citizen. He has Roman citizenship, something that is very rare in that day and that time. Uh, he had received Jewish training. In fact, he had sat at the feet of one Gamaliel, who was one of the leading Jewish scholars and theologians at the time. And so he is very well versed in Jewish culture, Jewish history, and of course, the Torah. Uh, and not only is he well versed in the Jewish culture and, 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 and learning, he is also very well immersed in Greek culture. Uh, he's very well learned in Greek culture. And so Paul is a very unique individual in that he has both Roman and Jewish uh, ties. He's very, very much a well-learned and educated man. We find here that Paul lived approximately 30 years after his conversion, and according to most historians and theologians, Romans was written about 20 years after his conversion. This book was written somewhere in the late winter of A.D. 57 or in the early spring of A.D. 58, somewhere right in that time period, again, about 20 years after Paul's conversion. And Romans is 
the first or one of the first New Testament books to ever be written. Paul picks up the pen and he writes to the church. Now, he is not writing, uh, uh, he's not writing this letter uh, just on a whim or happenstance. He's writing from the city of Corinth. Uh, he is, he's on his third missionary journey. In fact, you can look that journey up in Rome, Acts chapter 20. You can see verses 2 and 3 talk about him being on his third missionary journey in Corinth. Uh, we know that, uh, that, that, that he's writing from Corinth because he names a few people. He names Phoebe, uh, Gaius, and Erastus, all in Romans chapter 16. And these were, without a doubt, uh, these were citizens of, of Corinth. Now, the primary purpose for Paul writing the book of Romans, again, this is not by whim or by happenstance. He's writing to let the church at Rome know of Paul's intent to visit them. He's, he, he, his goal is to visit them very soon. However, the secondary purpose was to uh, supply by letter a, a, a doctrinal treatise, if you will, uh, he's wanting to give them some teaching that he has not been able to give them personally. And so he's writing to get them prepared for him coming. Uh, in fact, this book resembles a doctrinal treatise more than a letter. And uh, he, he probably wrote this from the burden of being the one sent by God to the Gentiles. And realizing that Rome was the greatest Gentile city of the day and the age, he writes with the hope that some way, somehow, he can reach the Gentile capital of the world. Notice what he's doing in purpose of writing. One of the purposes he writes is to ask for the prayers and assistance of the Roman church and his missionary work. Another one of his purposes is to, to instruct them to beware of false doctrine. And another purpose he writes so that they would understand God accomplishes an everlasting work uh, through him, and they, he wants them to understand that what he's doing and what he's writing is for not just their benefit, but for everybody that hears them and then reads the book. Notice it establishes the Gentile church and the gospel of salvation by faith, and from there it has become the springboard to the Gentile world. Paul's letter is the springboard to the Gentile world. Now, very quickly, let me discuss with you the structure of of the book of Romans. This is very important to understand. First of all, he begins with a prologue, and it's his personal introduction, his salutation, his expression of personal feelings, and then the theme of the book. I won't go into it quite yet because I'm going to read it a little bit more here in a second. But Then he goes to the body, which is Romans chapter 1, verse 18, all the way through Romans chapter 15, verse 13, and it's the substance or doctrinal content that he's trying to communicate to the church you'll see that he has some very specific themes in the body. He talks about the gospel of God's power unto salvation. He talks about the gospel of God's righteousness in relation to Israel. He talks about the gospel of God's righteousness as manifested in daily life. Okay, So he's very much writing to the church uh, and, and giving some very important themes in the word of God. And then, of course, he wraps it up uh, the epilogue from Romans 15, verse 14 to uh, chapter 16, verse 27, and he gives a personal conclusion to the book, okay? If you were to give a summary of the content of the book of Romans, you will find that there are five distinct areas or divisions in the book. First of all, he begins by talking about universal guilt, okay? Universal guilt. And basically what he's talking about is there is a universal need for God's righteousness to atone for the universal guilt of man. Uh, you'll see some of the verses that he pulls out, some of the things that he writes is the idea that we're all sinners, okay? And so uh, it's this idea of universal guilt. The second uh, area or summary uh, is that is this idea of justification by faith, justification by faith. And basically he's talking about the means uh, of receiving God's righteousness. My righteousness is, is, is nothing. In fact, Isaiah tells us that our righteousness is as filthy rags. Paul's talking about that, and he wants to give us the understanding that, that it's not my righteousness, but God's righteousness that keeps me. The third area he talks about is the believer's life. Again, he's talking about the believer's life, and he's talking about how God's righteousness produces a holy life. Okay? The fourth area is the condition of Israel. He talks about the past, present, and future rejection of God's righteousness by Israel. How Israel 
in the past, in the present, and even in the future, how they would reject God's perfection and God's holiness. And then last but not least, he talks, it gives practical exhortations for Christian living. He's trying to help the church in their day-to-day -day living and trying to get them prepared in how they need to walk with God. Okay? He's giving his righteous, our God's righteousness applied to practical life. Now, there are some key terms in Romans. Romans is filled with, again, some theological concepts. And I want to go over these very quickly with you uh, because you're going to hear them over and over and over again. Please take note of these because Romans doesn't make a lot of sense if you miss these terms. Okay, So let's talk. First of all, the first, tone, or the first term that Paul writes about a lot is the idea of atonement. Atonement. Uh, atonement literally means it's a covering for sin or satisfaction of divine judgment. Paul will also use the term carnal very much. A lot of times you'll see the word carnal. He's talking about the fleshly or the natural, okay? He, he, he uses the term exhortation. Number three, exhortation, which is an encouragement or comfort. He gives a lot of exhortation to the church. The fourth term he uses is the term faith. Now, we know Hebrews 11 and 1 defines faith as the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But Paul gives a little bit, uh, gives a great illustration and great definition of what faith really is. It's man's positive response to God's grace. Man's positive response to God's grace. And it's the means by which man appropriates God's grace. Okay? Faith is the means by which man appropriates God's grace. He also talks about saving faith. Interesting, he talks about not just faith, but saving faith. He differentiates between the two terms. Uh, what Paul means by saving faith is that acceptance of the gospel of Jesus Christ as the sole means of salvation and obedience to that gospel. Let me read that again. Saving faith is the acceptance of the gospel of Jesus Christ as the sole means of salvation and obedience to that gospel. Now, Paul also talks a lot about the flesh. He talks about the flesh. Now, what does he mean by that? Uh, he means, first of all, uh, he means the physical body. And, and an example of that can be found in Romans chapter 2, verse 28. Uh, but he also uses the term flesh to, dis to discuss or describe mankind, as found in Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Uh, flesh also is used to refer to human nature as found in Romans 1 verse 3. Uh, the fourth idea of the term flesh can be found in human weakness. Okay, Different from human flesh or human nature, uh, it's human weakness. Romans 6 verse 19 gives us an example of what he's referring to there. Uh, when he refers to flesh, you'll also find that he's talking about the sinless humanity of Christ. Okay, This is very important. Jesus Christ is a dual nature. He is 100% man, 100% God. Uh, he's the only individual uh, ever to be uh, that kind of duality. And so when he talks about the flesh, sometimes he's referring to the fleshly side, the human side of Jesus Christ. And an example of that is found in Romans chapter 8, verse 3. But then he, again, another idea of flesh, he, he's referring to the sinful human nature with its sinful desires. Romans 8, verses 8 through 9 discuss that. And, of course, he start, talks about the sinful nature still present in the believer. Romans chapter 7, verse 18 gives a perfect example of that. We're going to get to these uh, scriptures here in a moment. Another term that we need to be very familiar with is the term gospel. Romans 1, verse 16 tells us, Paul writes, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Okay, Very powerful statement, but what does he mean by the gospel? The gospel is nothing more than the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay? It's the good news that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again for our salvation. Another term we've got to be very familiar with is grace. Now, we've heard it in Christianity. What is grace? Grace is simply the unmerited favor of God towards man. Okay, If you don't get anything else out of what I'm teaching tonight, you get this definition, grace is the unmerited or undeserved favor of God towards man. It is that undeserved blessing of God. Probably the biggest term in the book of Romans, the one that we hear the most often, the idea that is presented the most, is the idea of justification. Justification. Uh, if you're taking notes, this is number nine. Justification. 
This is the act by which God declares a sinner to be righteous. Justification is the act whereby God declares a sinner to be righteous. Underline that, put a star by it. We're going to hear that term multiple times. The next term you want to know is the word justify, to declare righteous or count one righteous. Another term we need to be familiar with in the book of Romans, and again, it's like the term flesh in that it has multiple meanings throughout the, the, the writing, uh, and that is the word law, the idea of the law. First of all, it can refer to the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, as found in Romans chapter 3, verse 21. Or it can refer to the Old Testament as a whole, okay, all 39 books of the Old Testament. Uh, you can find that in Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Sometimes uh, Paul gets a little broad in his definition of the law, and he can refer to that just as a principle, an underlying principle, a foundational issue, uh, something that is very, very much a law of mankind. And he refers to that in Romans chapter 3, verse 27. Then he also takes and he refers to the law as God's moral law. Okay, There's In Romans chapter 2, verse 14, he refers to God's moral law. And then, of course, last but not least, he refers to the law of Moses, which is not just the writings of, of the Ten Commandments, but it is the, the entirety, every bit of the, 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 the traditions and the teachings that Moses gave the children of Israel. Okay? A couple of more terms, a few more terms that we need to know. First of all, we need to know the word minister in the, in the book of Romans is very important. It comes in two different forms. The noun form, which is a servant, attendant, or deacon. Or the verb form, which means to serve, to help, or to give aid. Okay? He also uses the term mortify. You'll see that a lot in the book of Romans. The term mortify literally means to put to death or to kill. He refers to the old man a lot. The old man a lot. Which he's referring to the unregenerate lifestyle or the time where we were in dominion. or uh, Sin had dominion over us or the dominion of sin in our lives. Another beautiful word in the book of Romans that you're going to want to know is propitiation. The word propitiation means the place of atonement or mercy seat. Okay? Reconciliation, again another great term. Reconciliation refers to the restoration of a relationship. Okay? Redemption, which is the complete deliverance by payment of a price. Okay? You see the word reprobate shows up several times and it refers to to the unqualified, worthless, base, debased, or deprived, okay? Sanctification means separation from sin. It's the process of actually becoming righteous, okay? God justifies us, which makes us, uh, which where he applies his righteousness to us, but he requires us to be sanctified and go through a process. Just like babies learn how to walk before they learn how to run, we have to learn how to be, become more like him and be holy. We also see the idea of spirit. The term spirit can refer to the human spirit, the God-conscious spiritual part of a man in contrast to the natural part of man. Okay. And the last but not least, the last term I want to leave you with is the wrath of God, which is the judicial attitude of God in relation to the sinner. I know that's a lot of terms. I know I've just thrown a lot of information at you, but there's a reason I want to do that. I'm trying to get you to understand that Romans is very, very rich theologically. There's a lot of great things in it. Now, I want to go ahead and I want to dig in to Romans chapter 1. Okay, We're going to start in Romans chapter 1, and I pray that you're blessed today. Romans chapter 1 begins by saying, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated into the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the call of Jesus Christ, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace be unto you in peace, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, as it's already been stated, Paul begins his letter with a salutation. He begins to write, letting everybody know who he is and what he has done. 
He, he writes as the apostle of the Gentiles and offers grace and peace to the readers. And he gives some personal feelings over the next few verses. Follow along with me as I read. Verse number eight. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout all of the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was led hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Paul picks up the pen and he now has gone from salutation to a moment of personal feeling for the church in Rome. He begins by talking about a true thankfulness that he has for them. And he reminds them, lets them know that he prays for them continually. He wants them to understand that he has a great desire to be with them. He wants them to realize that I'm doing my best to get to you because I want, I want to fellowship with you. I want to commune with you. And so he's, he's letting them know, I haven't made it yet, but I'm coming as soon as I can. And he also wants them to understand that he has obligations and a desire to fulfill those obligations by preaching the gospel. Okay? But then Paul launches into the theme of his writing. He writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Paul reminds the church, and informs the church, I should say, that he is not ashamed of the gospel. What an incredible statement. What an incredible thought. Whereas Jews and Gentile had little dealing with one another, Paul had no reservation about preaching the gospel in the city of Rome. He understands that it is the power under salvation which supersedes all human power, whether real or imagined. Paul knows that the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is by far the greatest thing, the greatest thing that the world has ever been given. And he goes so far as to say that it is through the gospel that the righteousness of God is revealed. Let me stop and say this. If you really want to know about Jesus, if you really want to understand his ways, if you really want to know his righteousness, then you and I can't just sit here and debate it. You and I have to know his gospel. There must be a day, there must be a moment where you and I come face to face with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ if we are to truly know him. And again, he reminds us of what, the, what is written uh, so many times in the, in the Old Testament that the just shall live by faith. Let us continue. <clears throat> Beginning in verse number 18, I'm going to read the rest of the chapter, and then we're going to just go, in, go through and break it apart. Verse number 18, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools." And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, for to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, 
for even their women to change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, bagbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Paul is writing here in his very first chapter of his letter about this idea of universal guilt. And he basically is saying that mankind is guilty. Kind of paints a bleak picture. There is no exception among humanity for the guiltiness of sin. According to Paul, there is no, uh, there's no way around it. We're all sinners. However, he doesn't leave it there. He says that there is also not an exception to the righteousness of God, to the Jew or to the Gentile. Doesn't matter. God has revealed his righteousness to all of us. And then he begins to talk about the guilt of the Gentiles. Romans begins, this, this chapter begins with the sinfulness of all mankind or all humanity. He talks about the sinfulness of the heathen and the pagan. And he talks about the sinfulness of those without knowledge of God in Christ. Okay? Now understand, Paul's not leaving anybody out. Okay? Paul's not, I'm not trying to, 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 to be combative today, but Paul is very clear that no one, if they breathe, nobody is exempt. Everybody has a guilt, guiltiness in sin. Everybody has made mistakes. And then he deals specifically with the sins of the Gentiles. Okay, verse number 18 shows us that universal sin will result in the wrath of God. It's revealed in heaven or from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Okay, the wrath of God will result, or universal sin will result in the wrath of God. Notice with me, righteousness and wrath are correlative, okay? Christ is either our Savior or our Judge. I don't know about you, but I want, to be, I want Him to be my Savior, okay? Righteousness is reveal, revealed by faith, and so also is judgment or wrath. In fact, verse 18 tells us that the wrath is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. He's talking about impiety against God and injustice against man. When he goes so far as to say that they hold the truth under righteousness, what he's talking about, that, that, that word hold literally means holding down and suggests that these men hold the truth but suppress it by unrighteous living. My goodness. Help us today. James says, To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Help us, Lord, to not suppress it by the way we live or act. Then God, or Roman, Paul goes a little bit further and talks about a knowledge of God through nature and conscience. Verses 19 and 20. Notice what he says. He begins to say basically that the invisible things of God are clearly seen. He leaves no valid excuse for the ignorance of God. You cannot say, according to Paul, you cannot say, I never knew God. I never had the opportunity because Paul says that the invisible things of God are clearly seen. Without his word, we still have nature. And without nature, we still have a conscience. Again, it says, invisible things of him since the creation of the world God creates, he was present at beginning, and his providence is his continual concern. He has continued to be involved. 
So, right, so that they, verse 20, are without excuse. What little any man may see in nature is enough to negate his excuses. I want you to think about that. You and I can stand on the edge of of the Grand Canyon. We can, we can look at the flowers in the field. We can see the sun, the moon, and the stars. And that alone is enough to negate our excuse of I never knew God. Amazing. Paul. Paul's writing, trying to help us understand that there is a mighty God in Christ. Amen. And then he goes further. Verses 21 through 23. He talks about the declension in sin. Okay? And basically what he's writing is being indifferent to God will result in a downward spiral. There's, there's some people that, that you look at or, or maybe not even you look at, you know that uh, they obviously do not live for God and they have no love for God. They are very vocal about it. We, we would immediately, in our humanistic way, we would immediately judge but Paul makes it clear that a lack of love or a lack of attention to God is just as bad. Being indifferent to God will eventually result in a downward spiral. This occurs when a man becomes vain in reason and develops a heart without senses. An absence of truth will always result in a positive error. Okay? We must not be indifferent to the things of God. A pride of wisdom would lead them, in verse 22, to foolishness. Their idea of wisdom would lead them to do foolish things. Professing themselves to be wise, they would instead become fools. Human wisdom, when set against God's wisdom, will always fail. My wisdom's not good enough. My way's not good enough. God's wisdom is the only thing that works. From there, this fall would lead to idolatry. Verse 23 tells us that man would begin at the highest form of worship in Eden in the form of worshiping God. But he would decline from there to idolatry. Okay, Just as human development is downward, so also is man's worship once he leaves the presence of God. And so, verses 24, 26, and 28, we find the three-word phrase God gave them, or the four-word phrase God gave them up, we find God's judgment after this, this move or this, this exodus from the presence of God. God allowed them to digress after their desire, and it appears to become a law of God. God always allows the cause to become the effect and for the process to continually repeat. Okay? Browning made the statement, we pay the price of lies by being compelled to lie on steel. And so this spiritual declension, we, this spiritual decline, it starts with terrible impurity, verse 24. This is the first stage in divine judgment. Once our thoughts become impure, so also does the body. Okay, and we talk, he's talking about sensual sin. It leads to idolatry, verse 25. Those sensual sins throughout history have led to idolatry. They worshiped, according to Paul in Romans 1, the creature more than the creator. And then comes the unnatural vice, verses 26 through 27. God gave them up to do things which were unnatural. Okay? That is to say, he removed his restraining hand and they did whatever they wanted to, whatever they seemed right in their own eyes. And it ends in complete depravity. Once again, God gave them up. Complete depravity is that point where all the concept of the distinction of right and wrong ceases to exist. What once was evil now becomes good, and what once was good now becomes evil. And we find that he gave them up to do those things which are not fitting. Evil will always be unsuitable and uncomfortable. Amen. Notice with me, he ends chapter 1 by talking about things which are not fitting. Okay? They're not convenient or not, not fitting. Okay? He gives 21 things that are listed here, and, and it's hard to classify because of, uh, it's hard to classify these. I'm going to try to do that today in our notes. I'm going to try to classify these 21 things. 
The first four are general descriptions of evil. You see fornication, which is to indulge in unlawful lust, including adultery and incest. Wickedness, which is the depravity of character. Covetousness, which is fraudulent, extortion, or greediness. Maliciousness, which is worthless and badness. The next eight speak of a disregard for proper relationships. We see I'm full of envy, which is to wish ill upon someone. We see murder, which is the slaughter of people. Debate, which is contention and strife. Deceit, which is decoy and subtlety. Malignity, which is bad character and mischievousness. Whisperers, those who slander by whispering. Backbiters, talkative against or slanderer. And then, of course, as you keep on going here, excuse me, my notes have messed up again on me, but I'll get back here in just a second. You see here where he also talks about uh, backbiters, those who are doing their best. <clears throat> there we go. Those backbiters who talk against their slander and then the haters of God which have an active hate for God. Then we see the next three which speak of a depraved character. We see the despiteful, which are the insulters, the proud, which appear to be haughty and above all others, the boasters, the braggarts, the, those that are trying to, uh, that, that don't have any humility. And, and then Paul concludes with six evils that express the unprincipled worthlessness of life. Okay? He talks about inventors of evil things. He talks about the disobedient to pa parents. Those that are without understanding, without natural affection, implacable, which are covenant breakers and truth breakers, no integrity, and then the unmerciful, those that show no mercy. And what we have is the distortion of sin. Not only does a man know that sin separates from God, he is also aware that there is a punishment for sin. He realizes that sin's ultimately, ultimate payment is death. And yet at the end of the day, he not only commits sin, but he also has pleasures in those that commit sin. You see, it's a distortion of sin. Paul's writing, now again, we're going to go somewhere with this. Paul's writing to the church in Rome, and he is very peculiar and very particular, I should say, about the fact that we have all sinned. Eventually, we'll get to it, Romans chapter 3, all of sin to come short of the glory of God. Paul's very clear that we deal with sin. But I've got good news for you. The book of Romans does not end with the first chapter. In fact, Paul gives us hope, and we're going to talk about that hope next week. We'll pick up with chapter 2. Again, make sure you download the handout. The student handout can be found at our church website, calvarytab.life. Go to our resources tab and you can download these notes. I'm going to go through this every Wednesday night now for the next few weeks. We're going to go through this and we're going to discuss this. I want us to be chock full of what God's Word has to say, understanding that His Word's powerful and it's going to change us again Paul's talking in Romans chapter 1 about those that have sinned, but I promise you he's going to have a better word for us as we get into the book of Romans. God bless you. Thank you for listening to Midweek Bible Study as we discuss the book of Romans, the gospel of God. God bless you.